Well, if you want sound to go further, you don't, some people say you like it throws sound or something like that. It doesn't sound moves on its own, you know, it's a way, but what you can do is control the dispersion of it. So, uh, if you got your garden water hose and you put it on spray, you know, it's the same amount of water coming out, but it goes, it sprays out in all different directions or at least, you know, uh, quite a bit. And then if you put it on the, uh, the twist it and make the setting where it goes straight out. Okay. It will, uh, be more concentrated in that area. So, uh, basically what you do is you just take that acoustical power and you, funnel it into different directions. So you might think it goes further, but it just makes it louder in that particular area. Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. Here's the first part of our Clubhouse discussion, Audio Electronics Explained. So almost every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, I host a weekly Clubhouse called The Power of Sound, where we talk about everything related to sound, such as music, podcasting, voiceovers, public speaking, audio branding, social audio, and of course, digital audio. If you'd like to drop by, just check the schedule at the Power of Sound house to see what's coming up. Just lately, we had a conversation, and everyone here knew that the room was being recorded, so I do have permission, called Audio Electronics Explained, where we discussed the science of sound and audio equipment. My fellow panelists in this discussion are Kicker's founder and president, Steve Irby, and audio engineer and Audio Sigma founder, Fernando Ede Pyers. They answer questions about how our audio experiences are crafted through the innovation of the hardware we use. If you've ever wondered how speakers create the sound you love, or have questions about how audio interfaces work, or want to understand what audio specifications are really saying, they are the ones to ask. And we had a great conversation about all these things, including acoustics and even some of the background involved in running a tech company, or two, that prides itself on being genuine. As always, if you have questions for my panelists, you're welcome to reach out through the links in the show notes. And if you have questions for me, visit audiobrandingpodcast.com, where you'll find a lot of ways to get in touch. Plus, subscribing to the newsletter will let you know when the new podcasts are available. And if you're getting some value from listening, feel free to spread that around and share it with a friend, along with leaving an honest review. Both those things really help, and I'd love to feature your review on future podcasts. You can leave one either in written or in voice format from the podcast's main page. I would so appreciate that. And now, here's our Clubhouse discussion, Audio Electronics Explained. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, And thank you for pinging people, George. Much much appreciated. (laughs) Uh, We are here to talk about audio electronics, and there are some truly excellent people to do that here. Uh, We will also be taking questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand or you can put the question in the room chat and we can ask it for you if you're uncomfortable coming on the stage. Uh, Hey, Byron, great to see you. Uh, So yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to getting into this discussion. Um, I know that uh, uh, both Steve and Fernando have uh, an enormous amount of expertise here. I also want to mention that we are recording. So just in case that's a concern, uh, I leave it up to you. If you want to come up on stage or if you'd rather ask your question in the room chat, you are welcome to come up, but just know that it is being recorded. So thank you, Fernando and Steve, so much for being here. Uh, Steve, if you could do us a favor and uh, and let us know uh, what your expertise is as far as audio is concerned, we'd love to hear about uh, what you usually talk about. I'm happy to do that, Jody. Uh, actually, more of my expertise is in acoustics rather than electronics. Sure. And uh, uh, I started my company in 1973. And we were building PA systems for bands. And I played in a rock and roll band, still playing a band, actually. (laughs) That's great. And building speakers uh, 
four bands for my friends mainly and uh, started in our garage and uh, knew very little about uh, building speakers other than that was a hobby of mine. And I had read a few things and built quite a few speakers. But uh, as time went on, basically, I was pretty much self-taught and uh, uh, built lots of speakers uh, in the uh, from the 70s, really through the 80s. We were primarily doing pro sound and, and uh, sound for bands and clubs, discos, churches, this sort of thing. And so I got my education uh, doing it as well as reading about it and talking to people. And uh, uh, But the acoustic aspect was really uh, kind of my forte. And that's still what I do today after all these years is I'm still involved in all of our research and development on acoustic products as well as oversight on the electronic products. Wonderful. So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely open to questions about acoustics or uh, probably uh, Fernando will take a little bit more of the actually electronic questions. Yeah. Sure. And I should mention that the company. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Thank you so much. I I should Uh mention that the company is Kicker just so that people are aware and, and Kicker does car audio. Is that, that correct? Um, That's yeah. That's our main business is car. Actually uh, secondary would be Marine. Oh, okay. And then we, we do motorcycle power sports and uh, we also build for uh, automakers. GM is our is our biggest customer. Oh, wonderful! That we build for a, a number of other automakers for uh, Toyota, Subaru, Ford, and uh, different different ones as well. Audio products, basically mm-hmm. uh, powered audio products. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we will definitely, I'm sure, have questions in the room uh, for people uh, that want to know more about acoustics mm-hmm. and, and, you know, specifically what you're providing there. Um, I want to ask Fernando, sure. too. Um, Fernando, what is your expertise as far as electrical engineering? And can you talk a little bit about the Pod Mobile? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, electronics is definitely my thing. Um, I started at the age of four. And I liked basically two things, things that move and things that make sound. Um, so I, I, you know, I liked when I was little to build my own remote control cars and boats. And at the age of 12, it became 100 percent audio. Um, I guess that that was probably because I started playing the guitar. But yeah, it just became from the age of 12 and onwards just the self-education as an audio electrical engineer. And um, it's quite different engineering for audio than anything else, robotics, uh, you know, or industrial computing applications. Audio, it's it's quite of a thing of its own, um, which is a, I, I love it because it's a blend of art with, you know, the, the exact engineering type things. Um, so I really love it. And, you know, being a musician, at least, uh, you know, a little bit of a musician does resonate strongly with me. Um, so, yeah, it was, um, you know, uh, audio has been my thing uh, from the age of 18 and onwards. Uh, instead of going to college, which, you know, I mean, I never went to college. I went for three months, if that counts. Um, I started my company in Brazil and uh, doing pretty much what Steve did when he was, you know, younger. Um, speakers for musicians, sound effects and uh, amplifiers. For, for music, basically, for stage application. And in 2012, I got into the car audio market because I learned uh, something called digital signal processing. And it, that was a niche for a particular product in the car audio. So I did that. And um, I worked as an entrepreneur in Brazil because I'm from Brazil. Um, from the age of 18 until 28, um, and then that expertise in the car audio led to Kicker uh, hiring me. And I've been working for Kicker ever since and uh, I'm completing the seventh year. So it was a long journey as an art engineer. Um, ele- electronics is, is my, my, you know, my, my expertise. Mm-hmm. I do a bit of the coding as well, enough to code the chips that go on the boards and absolutely passionate about audio and uh, to answer your question, the Pod Mobile, the reason I, I created that was uh, I wanted to record my audio book. And, you know, I, I wanted to do it. And, you know, I, I couldn't, I mean, I, I, perhaps I could, but 
I wanted to do it, it myself with my voice and not hire it out. And and then what happened is that the audio interface I had would not me- meet the noise floor requirement. And in doing some research, I didn't find anything that really inspired me confidence that was reasonably priced. So then I basically designed from scratch my own audio interface. And I have a friend that one day he come, he just lets me know that he sold one. I'm like, what are you talking about? So I had to to make it, you know, prettier than it was the first prototype and <laughs> refine it enough to, yeah. you know, to, to not feel guilty about taking somebody's money for it. <laughs> um, and that's the first pod mobile. And then lo and behold, I, I went to, um, to the uh, One Voice conference in Dallas. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I lived four hours away from it, basically just threw everything in the car and went there with a few prototypes on my hand. And people, people started buying those from me immediately. Um, and then, you know, it, it took, it, it got some momentum from there. And uh, I'm, I'm quite invested in, in that now. And, you know, my dream is to do basically what Steve has done, built his own company and, and brand. And, um, you know, I would like very much to become an employer. And, um, you know, I see the pod mobile as a seed for that future. Um, and I hope it is. Uh, so, um, you know, right now, today, with the consent of Steve, you know, he's fully aware of all that, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm working a full-time job at Kicker, which is honestly my dream job. It's like, it's as far as being an employee is concerned, I couldn't ask for anything better. And at the same time, I'm building Audio Sigma and, you know, the pod mobile seems to be the just first seed. That's wonderful. Yeah. And I have a pod mobile, so I know how good it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It sounds great. Huh? Yeah. Nice. Uh, Steve, you might be uh, amused by this, but on my trip home from Florida, when I was staying there after PodFest, (laughs) uh, I had a client on the second day of our three-day drive home ask Mm -hmm. me if I could do a job for um, like several automotive spots commercial spots. And of course, okay. you know, this is the this is the second day of our three day trip home in the car. And so in, in the, the car, car <laughs> I pulled out the pod mobile, used it with the rest of my gear and recorded That's... those spots for my automotive client, my Kia automotive client in oh my, my Kia okay. car. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, That's a perfect world. <laughs> yeah, it, it worked pretty well. <laughs> So that's, I can attest well, that that's uh, awesome. it works in a car. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Along those lines, I wanted to ask you, Steve, and this might seem really rudimentary, but, you know, for, for those of us who are lay people, as far as this con- is concerned, right. what do you, what would you define as sound and, and how do the speakers that you make create it? Like, how do they amplify it? Well, sound is... Uh, Trying not to be too technical, but you know, basically, sound is is pressure, like air pressure, that goes up and down. And uh, you know, I'm sitting here in my office looking out at the lake here, and you know, if you have a throw something in the water, you see a wave, right, that goes up and down, and it spreads out. And so, a speaker makes a wave like that, but it's in the air. And so, mm-hmm. the high pressure is the wave. The low pressure is the dip between the waves. And so that's uh, really what sound looks like, but it goes out and generally uh, in 360 degrees in a circle, you know, or a sphere around the object. Uh, there's more to it than that. But so it's it's a, it's an air wave rather than a, a water wave. Mm-hmm. And your ear is a uh, like a little tiny uh, membrane which is a microphone. And so that wave pushes in uh, on the eardrum, uh, kind of adds pressure, so it pushes it in, has a low pressure, so it kind of pulls it out. And that movement is uh, connected, you know, in short, you know, to your brain. And uh, so that's how you get the sound in. And uh, in a speaker, uh, a speaker makes the sound. And so what it is, it's kind of the reverse of your ear. In other words, uh, there's a diaphragm, which would be like your eardrum, although it's much bigger. And uh, you have a motor that pushes and pulls on that diaphragm. And uh, 
it's like a paddle in the in the water a canoe paddle you know so you're you're pushing it it makes a wave you're pulling it it kind of sucks down uh-huh. and so the motor pushes and pulls on the speaker cone which is like the paddle in the water is the speaker cone it's the paddle in the air and so that motor pushes the cone out makes high pressure pulls it back makes low pressure and that creates a wave that moves out from the speaker and then that's what reaches your eardrum and pushes and pulls on your eardrum which is connected to your brain and that's how the music is transmitted uh so we make uh there's all kinds of speakers though some are for low frequency which means they have to move low frequency waves are really big really long so the speakers have to move a whole lot push a whole lot of air because the sound wave may be 10 or 20 feet long and uh then you go up to the highest frequencies and the sound waves are uh an inch or less in length and so you just have a little tiny diaphragm and uh, that it doesn't take much to push those little tiny waves in and out mm-hmm. and uh then a mid-range speaker would kind of cover the range in the middle and it's kind of medium sized <laughs> and so <laughs> the more power that you put on that motor the further that cone will move in and out and it will create a bigger wave which is louder sound are you looking for ways to improve your company's or podcast's impact you'd be surprised how powerful the use of an intentional audio branding strategy can be want to know more i have a free downloadable pdf that gives you my 5 tips for implementing an intentional audio strategy at voiceoversandvocals.com/audio-branding-strategy that location does ask to put you on a mailing list just to send you updates on when the new podcasts come out. But if you really don't want to give your email out, I understand. Just contact me directly. My email is all over my website, and I'll make sure you get that PDF without needing to sign up anywhere. If you do sign up though, you also get access to a resources section called The Studio, where I have videos, white papers and PDFs, discounts from my guests, and snippets of audio from my guests that no one else gets to hear. So maybe it's worth your while. Totally up to you. And of course, if you're looking for voiceovers, you can get in touch with me about that too. Now, back to the podcast. Uh, what would be sense. the application out of curiosity for, um, you know, long range or, or medium and, and short? Well, if you want sound to go further, you don't, some people say you like it throws sound or something like that. It doesn't, sound moves on its own. You know, it's a way, but what you can do is control the dispersion of it. So uh, if you've got your garden water hose and you put it on spray, you know, it's the same amount of water coming out, but it goes, it sprays out in all different directions, or at least, you know, uh, quite a bit. And then if you put it on the, uh, the twist it and make the setting where it goes straight out, okay, it will uh, be more concentrated in that area. So uh, basically what you do is you just take that acoustical power and you funnel it into different directions. So you might think it goes further, but it just makes it louder in that particular area. I so, see. Okay. You know, so it's, uh, are you talking about a particular location for these speakers to be in? Like say if it's in a car, for instance, you don't need the long range. You might need a, a shorter range. Yeah, what? You want short range with more of the the spray, kind of like we're talking about, sure. rather than the stream of stream that goes straight out. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So that's uh, that's what we designed for is for good dispersion in the vehicle. But if it was a PA system outside for an outdoor concert, then it would totally be more different. Of the different. Yeah. 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 Uh, George is saying the controlled dispersion of sound from loudspeakers has revolutionized live sound. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, good stuff. Yeah, they've been doing that. Uh, there's been a lot of studies on how to control the dispersion of sound, but that's uh, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do that. And and once you understand that, then you can kind of make it go where you want it to go to a certain degree. Yeah. Hmm. So when you were coming up with speaker designs for Kicker, for instance, and I guess it would depend on what environment that speaker is going into, what were your particular um, considerations? 
Well, in a car, you have an enclosed space. And so you don't have to try as much to control where the sound goes because it's contained and it's, it's going to be louder as well. If, if you contain the sound all in a chamber, it's going to be louder than if you just let it go out into the world. You know, you're trying to fill the whole universe with the same amount of energy. So uh, the speakers in the car don't need to be as big for one thing to fill up the car with sound. And uh, uh, the other things are that you would like for the sound to come from the front of the car. Like if you were sitting at a concert or in a club or you're listening to a band, they're generally in front of you. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of the things that we do is designing for the sound to appear to come from the front of the car and also to have a, a, a center stage because like in a lot of cars, you know, you have left and right speakers, but, uh, the singer or the performers are in the middle. And so sometimes we add a middle speaker in there to handle the, the range and the different things that we can do even digitally Mm -hmm. to make it sound like the singer singer is right in the middle of the car instead of like coming out of the left speaker or the right speaker. Right. You reminded me of the key amplifier. With Fernando's the, been involved in that yeah. digitally a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Basically, you, you apply, uh, for example, if you're, you know, on the driver's seat, your left speaker is closer to you than your right speaker. And digitally, you can delay your left speaker so the, the sound of it comes to you at the same time as your right speaker. And that helps um, center the image because, you know, we're like our brain is designed to be that sensitive, just mega tiny delay and you can it will change the perception of a location of the sound um as if something drops on the on the floor like a coin drops on the floor you can tell if it's in front of you behind you left or right side mm-hmm. uh, largely because of that um delay to get to one ear or the other so that's how it's digitally done just actually put a reverse delay and make everything arrive to you at the same time is incredible it's so cool like when you go a and b like when switch between no delay and delay is obvious and you would never think that a teeny 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 tiny delay would do that it's super cool yeah that is so fascinating how that works yeah uh yeah. making our our senses work you know <laughs> with the audio equipment i love it <laughs> right yeah that's I guess why that's, you have two e- two ears. You yeah, know? that that's what helps you to locate the sound because yeah. there, there's a dis- distance between them, mm-hmm. and your brain can determine the time delay. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. That's how you can tell. Where, yeah, you know, where they do the are. same thing with uh, with your eyes, right? When if you see mm-hmm. if you're like nearsighted yes. and <clears throat> farsighted, and you wear contacts, they give you like one eye that sees far and one eye that sees close, uh-huh. and then your brain melds them together. <laughs> It's it's amazing. <laughs> That's how yeah. it works. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's very yeah. weird, but true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like you got a computer sitting in there, right? It's true. Yeah. yeah. Our, our senses are very strange and, and we're still trying to figure out exactly how all of that works together. Um, uh-huh. I, I've had discussions here where we've talked about how you can influence what you taste with what you, what you hear. So. Wow. Really? Yeah. Good. yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Steve Keller over at Sirius XM, uh, he's their sonic strategy director. He talks about that all the time. It's really, really fascinating. Uh, yeah, our, our, our brains are wired in, in very odd yeah. ways and, and all our senses work together. So yeah, I can see how making all of that work together in a car <laughs> with the equipment is, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. fun. I mean, really, it we is. need to start uh, selling perfume for the car for each music style you're listening uh-huh. to. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? So, though? like, uh, jazz would be this, you know, old wood type thing, and then <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. metal would be what you know. <laughs> that smell of pennies. <laughs> <laughs> one of those oh. would stink a little bit, perhaps. Yeah, I think you might have got to be careful with that one. Yeah, just a little yeah. bit. <laughs> no, that's funny. That's oh. funny. I don't know, can, can you imagine like a CD, an audio CD, coming with like a perfume like you're supposed to put oh that totally on you know uh, yeah mm-hmm. um uh studio resonate which is uh the sirius xm's advertising agency they do things like this like for instance oh, they wow. put playlists together for like um dove soap 
<laughs> or, you know, oh, so, really? so people could have a playlist to listen to while they were in a bath with bubble bath yeah. from Dove, right? <laughs> like a, <laughs> a good, you know, with a music. Yeah. yeah. But like a, a mango scent, it had like this tropical mango uh -huh. scent, right? So they would be playing music that you might expect to hear on a tropical island, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, well, yeah, interesting it's, stuff. But Really? Yeah, that's great. That's great. All, you know, you, got, you, you reminded me of a book mm -hmm. I read uh, years ago. Um, very interesting book by a neuro neurologist. I don't quite remember his name right now. Uh, Dr. Daniel Amen, if I'm not mistaken, something mm -hmm. like that. And he talks about like, uh, he has some some tips for people that are struggling with, you know, difficulties, uh, mental health uh, or emotions and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And I remember one of the recommendations he had for like, oh, you just had like a really bad day or kind of in a difficult place is an immersion of, uh, you know, what, what sounds good, smells good, uh, temperature of the water. And it was like an, uh, uh, he was deliberately using uh, as many of the senses he, he, you, you can to, um, to get you to like uh, feel better. And of, of course that, you know, will interfere with your state of uh, mind, and uh, very cool stuff. Like you know, he, mm -hmm. he was actually combining scent mm -hmm. and and um, and and the tactile. Um, tact Sounds like a spa. <laughs> kind of yeah. like it. You know, they can do it at, at your home. It was pretty interesting. Yeah, very cool science. There yeah, so is we're so kind of like making fun and all, and it's kind of funny what we're doing. But uh, yeah, there's there's real uh, science behind this whole thing. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. I know that we're all dealing with a lot of stuff these days, so I particularly wanted to acknowledge those that have taken the time to leave honest reviews of this podcast. Like Edward F2, who says, Jody does a wonderful job diving into the details of audio branding strategy with her guests. She finds a way to uncover great insights through light, entertaining conversation that will keep you listening straight through to the end. I'm really glad you enjoyed it, Edward. I hope you'll keep listening. And now, back to the show. I just I want to remind people uh, in the audience that we are talking about audio electronics and sound oh, yeah. and speakers. <laughs> That's right. And yeah. all sorts Almost of forgot. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no. It's fine. It's totally fine. Um, More or less. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, it can really go anywhere we want it to go. But uh, but yeah, um, that is that's the the topic that we've chosen for today, and we will probably meander all over the place, which is totally fine too. <laughs> and if anyone has questions, you are welcome to raise your hand or ask a question in the room chat. We can ask it on your behalf. So please, by all means, if you have anything you want an answer to, uh, Fernando and Steve have a world of expertise at their fingertips and, and uh, in their heads and can very easily answer anything you might want to ask. Yeah. So uh, I, I want to sort of switch gears a little bit here and get into the audio gear and mm -hmm. specifically specifications, Fernando. Oh. So I know that as voice talent, we're, we're taught to pay attention to certain things and they may or may not mm -hmm. really be important. And, uh, right. I'm sure, um, Frank and Byron and George and, and Jeffrey and, and anyone here who's involved in either podcasting or voiceover can attest to this. <laughs> Uh, but mm -hmm. what matters and what doesn't when it comes to the specifications for audio gear? Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, that's uh, there's a long answer to that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure the there question. is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I will. I'd like to start from the premises that um, you know numbers aren't everything. Uh, many of the measurements and the numbers that are published don't really reflect the actual use of the gear. Um, so, for example, it really, if you get like a preamp for a microphone, for example, right, and the uh, noise figure of an interface, the goal as far as utilization goes is that your background noise is within a good, acceptable range, right? Um, so, naturally, a consumer will tend to look for the interface that has the lowest noise for obvious reasons, and that is correct. However, uh, the published numbers usually, um, for you to measure noise, the first thing you need is a reference point. So, for example, if you have an audio interface and it says, oh, minus 120 decibels of noise, so that's 
that's amazing. Like minus 120 decibels is very, very, very little noise. But then you see how the measurement was taken, for example, it could be with one volt on the input or two volts on the input. And a microphone, when you gain it properly, the preamp, so you can hear yourself well and use it, that microphone is not going to put anywhere near that much voltage. Uh, one, two volts doesn't sound like much when I say it, but it's actually a lot. So let's change the units for the sake of uh, the conversation. So one volt's a thousand millivolts. So a thousand sounds a lot more like one. And for example, a microphone could be putting out as little as one millivolt, sometimes less than that, microvolts, or like 15 millivolts if it's like a super high output condenser mic. And then what I'm trying to get at is that the noise is measured, for example, more often than not, and pretty much every time, because then you get the biggest number to publish and bigger numbers look better, right? Um, you use a signal that is not not really, that is unrealistic in the it's application. Not, not real world. Correct, yeah. correct. And what happens is that once you start to crank up the gain on that, imp- that interface, so, you know, you get to where you don't have to speak right up against the microphone to get your voice at the right level, you start to observe that the hissing on the background starts to going up. So um, let's imagine just so we are comparing apples to apples that two interfaces uh, are tested at one volt for noise. So at one volt in, it produces zero decibels. And then once you remove that one volt, so it's zero volts, then one drops to minus 120 decibels of noise. And the other interface, the the second other interface drops to uh, minus 100 and you can say, and that is correct, that interface A is 20 decibels better in terms of noise than interface B. Okay, that's good. However, if you were to test these two same interfaces at one millivolt, which is a thousand times less, and that's more to where you're going to be using your microphone, uh, now it could be the case and often is the case that that very interface that was 20 decibels better could be 20 decibels worse or 10 decibels worse or they could match up or something like that so a microphone preamp will have a noise figure with the minimum gain setting and the maximum gain setting and yet another at the usable gain setting and what gets published more often than not is with that gain at the minimum because that's how you get the bigger number. And you see out there many interfaces that will publish a wonderful number. And if you test them, they probably will put out that exact number. But once you go use it, you find out that you're recording it, you know, not such a satisfactory um, noise floor. Um, So unfortunately relying on those specs doesn't lead oftentimes to uh, you actually being fulfilled in your expectations to the money you're spending. Um, And it's a battle that is hard to get in because it really truly doesn't matter. And you got to choose where your focus is in terms of development. Are you going to develop for the use or for the the numbers that get published on the box? And, uh, you know, that's something that is tempting because personally, like, I look at different interfaces and I want to compete with those numbers. And, you know, sometimes I will fall short, fall short of that uh, very published number, but I know that in the application, mine will overperform that one. Uh, So um, one thing that is, this is like just as important, if not even more as when it comes to noise and signal to noise ratio, which is basically how much noise you have, for your, you know, what you actually want to hear. Um, I'm actually, I'm going to turn this into a question. Imagine you you have a booth and in that booth, your actual background noise. So when you're speaking at your normal, comfortable level, that's zero decibels. That's your signal. And when you stop speaking and you have, you know, all the noise that gets into the booth from the outside world, that is uh, minus 75 decibels. So that's wonderful. Okay, so minus 75 is 
is your cutoff because that's what in reality is there. And then you have two options for audio interfaces. And let's say that interface A is minus 120 decibels of noise. And interfa interface B is minus 100 decibels of noise, 20 decibels worse. What do you think would be in an ideal world if you don't have any, you know, if the microphone doesn't have a noise of its own, the cables and et cetera, just, you know, in an ideal world, why do, what do you think the numbers will be once you introduce the noise of the interfaces to the minus 75 with interface A and interface B? Well, as low as possible. I mean, you don't want to add too much to the background noise, right? Right. So, okay. So with interface A, let's, let's say that with interface A, that is minus 120 decibels of noise, uh, you get minus 75 decibels in your recording, which is very good. Mm -hmm. Then you switch up to interface B, which is a mere minus 100. So it's 20 decibels worse. So it goes from minus 75 to what? Do you have an idea? Uh, I'm not sure, <laughs> but I'm sure you're going to tell <laughs> me. Wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't it be logical that if the interface B is minus, uh, sorry, is 20 decibels worse, then it would go from minus 75 to minus 55? Uh, well, yeah, I, I would assume. Exactly. And that's not true. It will actually have an impact of, of 0 0.45 decibels. So basically, really? it will go from minus 75 to uh -huh. minus 74.5. So if you invest, for example, another, I don't know, however many dollars to get this better audio interface, expecting that your noise floor is going to drop by a significant amount, and then you see just half decibel, I mean, that's pretty upsetting. Wouldn't you think? Uh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my point is, if you rely on the specifications without the knowledge of how these things actually work, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes, you know, oftentimes would be uh, disappointed. And in this particular case that I'm, you know, creating an example, you're better off buying yet another piece of insulation for the booth mm -hmm. instead of another audio interface or a different mic. This has been part one of our Clubhouse discussion. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time. <laughs>